thanks very much, uh, Barry. And um, I was in Paris, um, and uh, there was, a, I won't tell you a lot of things that went on there, but I think one of the things I want to touch on today um, is, uh, is what the uh, Australian contingent actually brought back from Paris, and I think it's re really important because framing of the opportunity um, to participate in carbon farming is actually um, something that clearly is the, the centrepiece of discussion today, particularly in the uh, rangelands in WA. I think framing the opportunity and sort of painting the business case for that, I think it's really important to understand the international dimensions and the domestic policy, because carbon is a really uh, a policy-driven market, and I think it's really important to understand that. Um, and so I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to be invited here today, and thanks to uh, David and um, Emma and uh, Joanne for, for organising and inviting me over here and um, uh, for Barry for the introduction and, and a beautiful welcome to country. I thought that was, that was wonderful too by the Reverend. And also I think it's really important, I know having sort of run events and bringing people together, how important sponsors are too. So I think um, Clayton Woods and Carbon Neutral and, uh, and the WA Outback um, uh, partnership is, is really important to, when, when you're trying to put something like this together and, and facilitate this kind of discussion. You need support from lots of people, so I appreciate um, all the work and the interaction I've had just to, uh, to come in. So, um, what, what I'd like to do um, is really sort of give an overview, I think, about certainly who, who we are, what, what Carbon Market Institute does and why we're involved actively in this space. Uh, and we have a number of members um, of the Institute in the room here as well. Um, build on um, some of uh, uh, David's perspectives in terms of what does the Paris Agreement mean for Australia and translate that back into, I suppose, the opportunity here on the ground. Um, an understanding, or my understanding, if anyone can really understand the, uh, the, the national political scene and where are we at at the moment and what does the policy suite look like and why does that sort of create, again, some of the opportunities um, that, we'll, that, that we'll hopefully talk about during the course of the day. And I think the evolving carbon market because when we're talking about carbon farming it is part of a market and so I'll try not to get uh, too jargonistic and, uh, and whatever but, uh, but it is important to understand the supply and demand characteristics which then ultimately lead to the economic potential or really the business case. So I'll try and frame what, what I have to say in, in the context of what we're trying to lead to is what's the business case, you know, what's the rationale for participating and, and, and investing in this, this area. Um, the um, Starting point, I suppose, is to is to also give some perspective that we we've actually learnt a lot um, over the years. As David highlighted, we've had multiple iterations of development of carbon markets and uh, and emissions trading and state-based and national schemes. And there is a very deep expertise um, in the organisation that that I uh, I uh, <coughs> have the uh, fortunate opportunity to run at the moment. It's it's the it's a collection of people and individuals within the membership base. That actually is a very deep body of knowledge. Um, hundreds of years, I, I'd say, even, even close to uh, uh, thousands, uh, a thousand years of expertise of people professionally who've worked in this space. Um, and when you when you put people together um, and you provide us with constructive input into into government, uh, into the policy making process, and and into the market development. Um, it becomes really important to connect people and to sort of leverage the knowledge and insights that people have to help create the market. And that's really what we try and do, is try and connect um, our members um, uh, who, who cover really the ecosystem of large emitters and, and project developers and professional service providers and financiers. And we try and connect their collective body of knowledge um, and, and take that inside the tent into, into Canberra in particular, where at the end of the day, politicians deal with a whole range of issues but what they really what they really don't have is um, in my view really deep authoritative independent advice um, that that can help them inform how they implement their policies and so we've taken a position at the carbon market institute that we won't be a lobby group we're a business association but we won't actually lobby hard what we'll try and do in the context of operating in a very um, uh, tumultuous political environment that we've had over the last four or five years in particular, um, is to provide an um, independent voice of our members inside the tent to inform how governments of the day, the government of the day, um, can implement their policies to best achieve our public policy outcomes, which is, you know, achieving emission reduction goals, and to also benefit the market and create economic opportunities. So if we become a, a, a trusted voice, uh, an independent voice, 
which, um, which is, I think, really appreciated by all sides of politics. We get to have a, a marginal degrees of influence over how the government's policies can play out. And it's really important to recognise that we've just gone through an election, uh, as you all know, but it's the first time in many electoral cycles, probably over a decade, that we've actually got the same climate policy suite from one election to the next. We're not repealing something, we're not changing something, we're not, we're not you know, rewriting new legislation, we're not having multi-party committees on climate change. We're, we've actually just got the same policy suite. It's gone a little bit under the radar, but that's actually really important to, for us now to actually build on. So we have an international agreement, we have a domestic policy suite, so within that we're actually for the first time I think moving to at least one uh, election cycle of certainty. And so, um, our role, we see our role at the Carmichael Institute is, is to sort of increase the influence we might have through our members to um, make sure that that policy, the policy of the day is implemented effectively and that it creates economic opportunities for our members but it achieves um, greater outcomes in terms of in environmental and social outcomes in achieving our public policy. Um, one of the things that we do, I just wanted to highlight, is that once a year we have uh, our annual um, summit in, in Melbourne at the MCG. Um, and uh, if, uh, if any of you want to mark your diaries for the 2nd and 3rd of May, it's, uh, it's the, uh, the climate change jamboree that you really want to be part of. It brings together the key decision makers globally, locally, um, and, and, and the suite of um, people. We had about 500 people at, at the last summit. And over a couple of days, it really is the opportunity to make the connections that are really important. Um, <coughs> That's just an example of the membership of CMI and why I highlight the diversity of the spread there. You can see whether it's um, uh, you know, people like the Kimberley Land Council or Qantas or uh, Origin or ANZ. There's a, there's a range of, of companies. We need that expertise coming together to actually create the market. But what we really need is, um, is uh, the, the global and domestic policy suite to sort of drive the, um, the framework that allows business to, to have some certainty around investing. Because when you look at carbon farming, when you look at what the opportunity is, it's a long-term opportunity where you want some security that when you're making that investment, you're making those commitments, the policy environment, which, as I said, it's a policy-driven market, uh, but the policy environment gives you some certainty that you're going to get a return on investment. So one of the great things that happened, uh, as David highlighted, uh, last December was in Paris, was the coming together of the world. I think it was such a, it was a diplomatic triumph. It was something that, um, you know, I think there, there was some, some levels of euphoria that the world could come together and sign up to something. Um, it, was a, it was a great privilege to be there. Um, what what, I, what I've, uh, sort of my takeaways from there, which, um, you know, we led a delegation of about 20 businesses. It was great. There was, you know, there was a lot of Australians there. There was one function that um, uh, Minister Julie Bishop held on, a, on, on one of the nights that she was there. There was about 200 Australians in the room, which was quite significant because the year before, um, the, the equivalent conference the year before in Lima, there was, uh, there was maybe 15 Australians in, in the room. So having that number of people gathered, um, you know, with the significance of the kind of organisations there. In our delegation, we had CEOs and executive levels of companies like AGL and Qantas and Telstra and South32. And by being there participating, you could actually see that their peers, business peers um, around the world, were signing up to very significant commitments to transform their businesses, very significant commitments from major financial institutions, very significant commitments from, um, you know, a thousand mayors were gathered. Uh, you know, in one, one particular meeting. So you had, um, you know, not just um, the, the UNFCCC, the United Nations and the sort of the bureaucratic process they were going through, there was a real energy and input. And what one of the, the key takeaways there is that this transition, the momentum that is already, already in play from business um, and finance, in many ways our business communities have moved ahead of where domestic policy is going. There was a, there was a forward direction that, um, that this um, transition to a decarbonised or a low carbon economy um, or a no carbon economy is underway and, and business get it. And I think that's really important that, that you know, since Paris, when I've gone around and done you know, 20 or 30 in-house company briefings of, well, what does that Paris agreement, all the jargon mean to us? Um, really what the conversation that's taking place is, okay, well, what, what do we do about it? How do we manage our, our risks? How do we reduce our emissions? Well, how do we optimise our position under different types of legislation? And that leads to a really interesting sort of discussion internally that's happening in, in a lot of businesses in Australia. 
what is their position on uh, emissions reduction? How do they actually transform their own business? What does their supply chain look like? And where do they invest in terms of projects and, and abatement um, that's going to be required? And again, understanding that is really important because ultimately their businesses, um, I think in Australia, are going to be the buyer of the credits, which I'll outline shortly, of, of the projects that could be invested in, in the rangelands here in WA. Um, Another, another sort of key takeaway, it's like the big coal's hand, isn't it? The, the emissions trajectory is down. It's only going to go down. And to whatever extent countries have committed their own carbon reduction plans, or NDCs, as David said, whatever countries have committed, um, it's, a, it's an emissions reduction. Even um, our, our great former Prime Minister, um, Tony Abbott, was, was stood up and said, look, our emissions reduction commitment is you know, 26 to 28% below 2005 levels. What does that translate to? It's below business as usual. We have to actually go below business as usual, not continue business as usual. So that has that requires a change. So the, the, the emissions trajectory here and in every country of the world is down. So what that that's the operating environment that we're going to exist in. And therefore, in a place like Australia, our policy settings, as in every other country that's made a commitment, the policy domestic policy settings are going to tighten. There is going to be policies that will drive and, and um, incentivise and also force um, business and communities to reduce their emissions. That's the pathway we're on. In doing that, it's going to create and spur a lot of opportunities. So when you... Um, I was at a, a particular briefing in Paris and it was the, um, it was the Chinese chief de delegator, uh, de the head of the delegation, and it was a... Um, and in the front row, um, it was about China and the US and low carbon economy. That was the theme. And in the front row was um, Michael Bloomberg um, and um, Jerry Brown, the governor of California. And it was all quite civil. And the Chinese, um, through, the, through the earphones, uh, through the translation, were saying, look, you know, we're very keen to uh, partner with our friends in America and we're very keen to cooperate um, with our friends in America. Um, but, um, but we're going to compete with our friends in America. And I was like, OK, that was quite powerful. And then Jerry Brown gets up and the Governor of California throws away the script and he looks at him and goes, we're going to compete with you too, don't we? We're going to compete with you, we're going to win this. And so it was like, it struck, struck then, it was like, OK, there's a big economic battle that's going to go on. Right? If we're not part of it, right, this transition to a low carbon economy, how cities are actually designed, how transport and infrastructure works, how industrial parks invest in R&D and technology, how you bring innovations to market, this is going to be a radical transformation of the energy mix and energy supply, but of all facets of how uh, economies operate. And there's so many different components to that that we've got to actually understand. This is the transition that's on, and the competition for market um, and, and for economic opportunities is going to happen whether we want to participate in Australia or not. So where, where is our competitive advantage, I think, is one of the things that I wanted to highlight um, uh, later on. Um, to get there, we're going to need a lot of money, and that financing gap is, um, is is clear now. But there's plenty of dollars out there. You know, any time you speak to a bank or to a funds manager or to a multilateral agency or to a sovereign wealth fund, um, they got plenty of money looking to invest. There just isn't the vehicles and the projects and the uh, and the avenues to for them to put their money into at the scale that they're ready to deploy. But that's also a very significant um, uh, opportunity that Australia, with very sophisticated capital markets um, and very sophisticated um, project finance uh, capability, is that we could actually really participate um, in this from a finance function as well. Um, one of the other takeaways, I think, you know, I mentioned there was about a thousand um, city mayors there in one of the meetings in Paris, is that um, there's a lot happening at state and, and local level. Uh, and this is where, you know, say somewhere like California um, has really broken the mould. Irrespective of um, what happens um, uh, at, the, at the federal scene in, in the US and even if um, uh, the great Donald Trump, um, you know, becomes president, California has got, its, you know, it's the seventh largest economy in the world in its own right, has got its own emission reduction targets. They've, they're very um, uh, ambitious. They've survived multiple changes of government. Um, but it's driving real economic um, output. They've created electric vehicle infrastructure. They've, um, they've got massive transition to renewable energy um, uh, in, in the system. They've been able to meet their goals and set higher and higher goals. 
because there's a state that's actually taken a leadership position. And we're starting to see that more and more at a sub-national level. And I think there's a real competition is sort of kicking back in here in Australia. Uh, I get to you know, interact with state governments around the country and I know that they're sort of positioning to try and retake a leadership position. So what's, what's WA's position? Where is it if I'm, a, if I'm one of those member companies from CMI, I'm looking to spend money or invest in a, a particular um, area, whether it be carbon farming or whether it be a, you know, a new energy service, where do, I, if, where do I spend my time? Is it in South Australia? Because Premier Weatherall's been quite, quite out there and sort of saying, you know, they want, they want to attract business. Is it in Queensland, where the change of government there has, has now got a, um, a minister that's just really interested in to, to um, engage with business? Victoria, where it's got a new Climate Change Act that they want to implement? The states in Australia also, I think, have to realise that there's going to be a competition for internal investment. So when we look at carbon farming, and when we look at the opportunities and we see how much um, has been um, invested in, in uh, Western New South Wales, for example, why isn't WA cap capturing some of that? Right? So these are the kind of things that I think at state government level need to be considered. There's a competition for the investment um, and the engagement with business. And we're seeing that, that internationally. And so um, that, I think, is something that's going to play out quite significantly in Australia over the next few years, again, irrespective of what happens at the federal level. Um, I think what does the Paris Agreement mean is that there is a demand for capability, finance, technology, market design, um, monitoring, reporting, verification. If you look at um, the capability that we have sitting um, you know, relatively idle in, in uh, large towers like this in, in capital cities in Australia, a professional service capability, uh, legal and emissions management and uh, verification and auditing, all of the services needed to, to do projects like, like carbon farming, um, very significant expertise and vastly underdeployed when the rest of the world, countries like Indonesia or Peru or Kazakhstan are moving forward in developing their own uh, energy um, management and reporting, um, their own uh, market-based systems, their own um, regulatory systems where we've got all of this capability in Australia the potential to actually uh, create an export market for our professional services, our, our project development capability, our finance, that's going to involve our, um, our, our federal government to actually engage proactively with countries in our region and try and align the aid and the trade and the diplomatic efforts to create that market opportunity for Australian companies. But that's, again, what we've got to realise is that there's a marketplace evolving quite significantly and Australia can participate in this. Um, and, and when I say market, I, keep, I, I use the word because I'm allowed to because I'm from the Carbon Market Institute, but, but market mechanisms are going to increasingly be one of the ways that we're going to uh, uh, you know, address the issue of meeting um, our individual countries' goals on emissions reduction. Market mechanisms allow for um, a, an efficient way to actually achieve emissions reduction with private sector investment and technology um, deployment. So market mechanisms are going to become more and more of a feature of a country's policy suite. Out of the 190 odd countries that put their carbon management plan or their NDC to the UN, uh, as David highlighted, uh, 90 of them said we're going to use a market mechanism to help achieve our goals. Right? So that means that the markets are going to evolve um, internationally. And Paris, uh, in my view, is, you know, sends the, the largest signal. It's the mother of all market signals. Again, the emission trajectory is down. Countries are going to be participating in emissions reduction. What, what are we going to do in Australia to create the economic activity that will actually benefit um, our, um, our emissions reduction uh, task, but also create um, Crack wealth for, for Australia in the process. Um, the most important um, framework for anyone in this room looking at participating in carbon farming in, in WA um, is going to be determined by the national policy suite. And we've had um, uh, the federal election results are, are now in. We know the coalition um, has, uh, has been successful again. Um, there are a number of key people, I think, the people on this slide, I think, are the key people who will actually influence um, the stability and the, uh, the future of climate policy in Australia. And it's really important that there is long-term certainty, because if we're looking at projects that need to, you know, an investment horizon of um, 10 years or 20 years or 100 years, 
you want to be sure that the policy environment allows that to, to happen. Um, some of the key people, um, I think um, Minister Bishop is a, is a key player. Uh, Josh Frydenberg is, is critical um, as the new Energy Environment Minister. Uh, Greg Hunt um, will, will play a significant role around the Cabinet table because he brings um, interest and, and uh, perspective uh, to, to the discussions. And Steve Chibo, the, the Trade Minister also, I think is really important. The Nationals, Barnaby Joyce and Matt Canavan, are also really important. So understanding that these are the people that are really core to making the decisions around the climate policy suite in Australia. Uh, and then you've got the opposition parties, the, uh, the, the Labor Party, Nick Xenophon and Richard Di Natale. We've been in, sort of engaging with all of these people since the election uh, directly. And what we know is that there is the prospect of actually maintaining our policy suite and getting some, uh, some, some real focus on how the policy suite can be improved. So what do we have? What is the climate policy suite in Australia? The start, starting point is the Emissions Reduction Fund. Uh, the Emissions Reduction Fund has three elements. It's the crediting, purchasing and the safeguarding of emissions. Two and a half billion dollars was, was, was uh, put in the kitty to start with. Um, uh, there's about uh, 800 million dollars of that left. Um, there's been three options, and the fourth option was announced yesterday. It's going to occur in, um, in November. I'll come back to the ERF uh, shortly. The safeguard mechanism is something you may or may not have heard about. It's gone under the radar a little bit, but it is actually um, in operation as of the 1st of July. And what the safeguard mechanism is, is it puts a baseline on industry to say, if you exceed a certain number of emissions, you have to purchase um, uh, credits to stay below your baseline. Um, it's really an emissions trading scheme, um, somewhat by stealth. But at the initial baselines are set very high, very generous over the largest emitters in the country. So in the next few years, it's unlikely there's going to be um, too many companies that will exceed their baseline and have to actually uh, purchase emissions. And there's, a, there's not a great penalty um, scheme associated with it. But the safeguard mechanism is, is something that can evolve to be um, the primary policy driver and also the, um, the key um, uh, private buyer of credits. If the safeguard mechanism kicks in in a way that we expect it will and, it, and that it should to help meet our target, um, each, com each company covered under that will have a baseline that declines over time. And as that baseline declines, they're going to have to either reduce their emissions through their operations or purchase units to stay below that baseline. That drives the market. So the linkage between those two is very important. The Emission Reduction Fund has the methods uh, uh, that, uh, that create the projects, uh, but the, and, and at the moment the government is the buyer, the sole buyer, pretty much, of, of the credits issued under um, the ERF. And then the safeguard mechanism, if those baselines start ratcheting down over time, out to 2030 and beyond, you will then start seeing a very significant private market emerge. And again, that's really important to understand the business case we're participating. Um, we have a renewable energy target and a national energy productivity plan, uh, which hasn't really been fleshed out. This, this uh, bar graph here, the green, the green, pink, yellow, etc. this is what Australia took to Paris and said, we will meet our 2030 uh, commitments um, through these different policies and this is where the different contributions kick in. So when you look at the green, that's the, uh, the, uh, the dark green at the top is ERF and the, and the lighter green is the safeguard mechanism. So the safeguard mechanism is going to do, have to do a lot of heavy lifting, which means that there will be a price on carbon in the system. There will be a cost to business. They will have regulation that will cover them over that period out to 2030 if the government's own uh, proposal is going to be met. So that's going to cause some real discussion around the cabinet table, um, and we, we're going to actually probably see some of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the climate policy discussions uh, uh, get ugly again. But let's hope that there's that this this kind of um, uh, plan is actually implemented. This is the government's plan, and I think what you know that the, there should be the gas put on the government to say this is your policy, your proposal. How are you going to do it effectively? And one of the keys is going to be those baselines declining. Um, just a little bit on the Emissions Reduction Fund. The Emissions Reduction Fund uh, projects, they must sit under an approved method. And those methods, which are developed by the, the government, um, are quite robust, um, and they really determine how to carry out the project and how to measure and estimate the results. Um, if you want to fall asleep on a plane ride from Melbourne to Perth, download a copy of one of the methods and have a read. 
right? It's not really that, uh, that engrossing, but there are a lot of people that can explain and interpret those methods for you. But it's really important to understand what type of method might be applicable to any particular project right up front, that, that's really critical. Approved methods under the Emissions Reduction Fund, which have transitioned from the carbon farming initiative, and I think that was a really successful um, outcome. And some of the work that we did with, at CMI was to work with the um, then new Abbott government to transition the carbon farming initiative into the Emissions Reduction Fund. What we've done, I think, uh, collectively, with, and, the, and the work of the Clean Energy Regulator as well, is to preserve our domestic offset scheme. So our, our domestic offset scheme goes from the Carbon Farming Initiative to the Emissions Reduction Fund. Uh, we were able to generate um, Australian carbon credit units through a whole range of different types of projects on the land, transport, waste, in, energy efficiency, industrial and mining and oil and gas. Some of the ones that are most relevant to the discussions today, which I know there are other presentations that will go into more detail on some of these, um, are the methods around the vegetation management, um, which, you know, we, 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 as I say, we'll go into more detail on these during the course of the day, and then uh, around agriculture. So you've got some of these methods are most applicable for most of the discussion during the course of the day. Um, just in terms of the results, there, there has been, I think it's been uh, quite successful as, a, as an initiative, the ERF, it has actually transacted with bona fide project proponents that have put real projects up, that are delivering real abatement, that is, um, that is yeah, leave aside whether the government should fund that exclusively or not. I think there's always room for government funding of abatement, and every previous government has had some uh, government public funding towards abatement. The fact that we're missing the emissions, for the safeguard mechanism and a proper market-based mechanism, I think, is a gap. Uh, in, the, in the policy suite, but in standalone, I think the ERF has been pretty successful with, um, with over $1.7 billion worth of contracts that have been established, and we're starting to see those projects now issue permits. So over the next 10 years, we're going to see a lot more checks going to farmers who have uh, participated as part of the, these projects from the abatement that's generated on their land. And as that starts to happen, I think we're going to start to see more and more conversations about, well, hang on, how come, how come we're not participating? when you've got you know, $300 million going into Western New South Wales and, and that sort of thing and being dispersed amongst landholders, this is actually a, a scheme that will, I think, transition from government funding through, through the auctions um, that have been held to the private buyers. Um, the safeguard mechanism I've sort of touched on in terms of what the trajectory it needs to go down in terms of putting baselines on industry. Um, I think it's important to highlight that I had the chance to meet up with the new Environment Minister uh, a week before last. Um, he sees, and it's his you know, portfolio now that's really critical, how do you align uh, energy and climate? I think that's really important. He, he wants to see, and his philosophical position is we're into this transition. That's great. We've got an Environment Minister um, that sees the transitions on, that we've got to get greater alignment at state and federal level. And again, it's up to the state politicians, I think, to engage constructively. Um, We've got to get a stable landscape, and we've got to also, from his point of view, um, you know, he used the words political leadership, which is nice to actually hear in the same uh, in, in the same phrase, um, and, and also bipartisanship. So, if that's what his aim is to actually have a stable policy suite where he works constructively with um, the, the the Labor Party, with the Greens, with the Xenophon, etc., that's going to be a good outcome for all of us. So, some really good positive signals signals to start with. The major first major. Um, project in his portfolio is to, to undertake a policy review, look at the policies that we've got and are they suitable or effective to meet our international commitments. And it's a really important time for us as an institute to influence the terms of reference for that policy review. If they're really narrow, then we're going we're gonna to get a politicised process. But if they're broad enough to say, well, what are the opportunities for Australia? How do we participate in the international market? Is there an export market for our for our credits generated? And what do we need to do to get there? And how do we really put a, a proper market signal in place? And th these are big questions. But so, so our, our focus, and you know, my um, uh, sadly lots of days in Canberra, um, you know, is, is focused on trying to make sure that the politicians hear that business want. To, to see a long-term policy framework that they want certainty, that they want bipartisanship. Um, I'll try. I'll just. I'll just sort of wrap up with just some some commentary around some of the international developments around carbon pricing, because this this map, without going into too detail, um, is indication of the different schemes that are evolving around the world. The Paris Agreement, as David mentioned, does actually explicitly say that there is going to be 
market um, conditions, uh, market um, and mechanisms where if we generate credits in Australia, it's not just domestically, but there's an international market that is going to evolve. So the long-term evolution of the carbon market is really, really critical. Um, and if you're looking at participating in projects here in WA, uh, which is the focus of this, this conference today, is what's the demand? Who's going to be the buyer? Right? It's really important to understand some of these ultimately in, in looking at participating. There is a demand from the, the Emissions Reduction Fund at the moment. There's $800 million left and, and it's quite likely to be topped up to some degree. There is going to be a demand from the private sector, heavy emitters, as the policy of the safeguard mechanism demands that they meet their um, emissions reduction by purchasing it. There's another very significant demand driver. There is an increasing demand coming from the voluntary market as businesses are looking to go carbon neutral and Kent Broad's here and talk, we'll talk about some of that, uh, that, that, some of the opportunities in the voluntary market and, and where, um, where people are heading in that. There's a secondary market um, which is um, generating credits that could be sold um, between, uh, outside the here adoption process and directly to, to companies. Then we've got the international dimensions where um, emissions intensive trade exposed industries and many of the large resource companies here in the US, <coughs> so in the, in the, in the West um, here, are exporting now their uh, energy intensive goods into countries like China and Korea which have a carbon market, they have a carbon price. So what's the prospect of potentially stapling US, uh, sorry, um, uh, WA um, credits to energy intensive exports when they when it's making those exports carbon neutral or transferring these credits into into um, into other schemes like China. So these models are going to evolve, and so thinking about those demand factors, and then you've got um, you know the 180 190 other countries are all going to have to meet their emissions reduction commitments, and there's going to be a demand for uh, bona fide credits um, offsets that they can act that will actually be transacted in the international marketplace. So all of these factors are quite important to consider that there is a, an evolving carbon market demand. Well, where's the supply? Australia actually has a well-designed, well-governed scheme that can actually generate um, you know, good, low sovereign risk units. Um, so that the Australian's, Australian marketplace could potentially be a real source of supply, both domestically and internationally, which is something that really opens up a you know, multi-billion dollar export market. Um, we have had um, a lot of supply come from the Kyoto mechanisms, from the, the Certified Emissions Reduction Units. So these are projects that have generated over 3 billion credits. This has been a success. We've had a lot of projects internationally operating. And then there's other voluntary market and international schemes. Um, so just to finish, what's the business case? What is the economic potential? Um, if I can link some of the market developments and the policy together, um, as I said, Australia has a well-designed, well-governed scheme. Um, we've been able to keep the architecture in place. The Clean Energy Regulator governs this. If you're looking to participate, um, it is, is under a scheme where there is real market integrity and there are really good operators um, that can actually help, um, help you actually uh, participate, but under rules that are really clear. Um, we've got deep competency. We've got all the whole suite of monitoring and reporting and verification and project development and aggregation. Um, broking and legal advisory services. You know, a lot of those companies exist within the membership. If anyone wants to actually be pointed to or connected to anybody that they think might be able to um, help them, feel free to get directly in, in touch with, with myself. Um, we've also seen a lot of successes. Um, we've seen some companies that have really invested and created really good business models under the RF and are actually generating really good returns for their business, employing people, but generating real projects on the, on the ground. And companies that you know again sit within our membership like Green Collar and Climate Friendly, Freddie Sharp's here, the CEO of Climate Friendly, they've been doing some really innovative things with landholders. And I think they're the kind of people that are really the, the right source of uh, help if you're looking to participate in these, in these markets. And finally, there's a range of um, uh, co-benefits that come from. The business case is not just around getting a carbon unit, but there are other social benefits, there are other environmental benefits and biodiversity benefits. Um, and finally, where we are at the moment, um, the policy settings are as, are as low as they're going to be. They're only going to get more, more stringent. We're, this is the floor. We're going to go into a world where nationally and internationally, the settings to drive emissions reduction are going to get more onerous, and therefore the opportunity to participate in carbon farming and leverage some of the, the, the great resources here in Western Australia to participate 
um, I think could be a real opportunity to provide an evolving carbon market. And, and not just nationally, I think, I think globally. Maybe in 10 years' time we'll prove whether that's right or not. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of opportunities to directly engage with corporates um, who, again, you know, are in this room and in this environment, and certainly within our membership, who will be the buyers. So the direct transactions that are going to take place because companies are going to want to uh, head down this uh, low emissions path themselves. Um, and finally, I think, you know, this is underway, this is happening now, the shift is underway, um, and so this is a great opportunity and time to participate and bring people like this together for the discussion, so I think it's a really laudable thing. Thanks very much, and um, I'll be around if anyone wants to catch up with questions.